questions, kind of think about the rest of these are stuff we talked about last week. Um, maybe what is the assessment data I'm supposed to know? What kind of complications are involved with this? Uh, what do I expect my outcomes to be? And then, you know, just that's nursing process. So think about that. Which system specific assessment would indicate the client might be developing a lower urinary tract infection. Cystitis. This is an all that apply. Which action is appropriate for the RN to delegate to the assistant personnel for clients with ureteral stones? is appropriate for the RN to delegate to the oh wait why is it not going to do this early there we go what is the appropriate response for a client with the calcium oxalate stone who asks why is it important to see the dietitian before going home Y'all do me a favor and put your pen down when you finish the answer. That way I'm 
is of most concern when stated by a daughter who brought her 88-year-old mother to the urgent care center. Clinical finding indicates the development of a potential complication for a client in a long-term care facility with urinary incontinence. Which intervention is appropriate to implement for an ambulatory client who is receiving bladder training? What is the priority nursing action for a client with an indwelling calf whose system-specific assessments include oral temperature of 102.2, has hot, flushed skin, and dark, cloudy urine in the collection bag? by a young female being discharged following the UTI indicates an understanding of how to prevent future UTI.
<clears throat> Let's go back to the beginning. Uh, clinical assessment for a client who has a TURB post would require notification. What'd y'all get? Uh, two. Sharon, what'd you get? Three. Three? All right. Anybody get anything different? Not going to admit it? <laughs> nope. Three is correct. <laughs> you should not, after two days, be having dark red urine. What would that tell you? They're bleeding somewhere. Something's bleeding, and we could get hypovolemic. Uh, so that is not an expected outcome. And once you know more about that TURP and stuff, you look at you'd be asking yourself, okay, what do I expect to happen, and which one up here would not be an expected outcome? All right. Christina, mm -hmm. what do you think about number two? Um, one, three, five. Mm, you're awfully close. And four. <laughs> <laughs> it is one, three, and four. Okay. Uh, inability to void. What would that be a problem with? I like an obstruction or an obstruction, a stone, something like that. Or uh, you know, it shows there's some kind of retention going on. And what about why didn't anybody want C D A tenderness? That's what it meant, right? That's for pilo. That's up in your kidney, and we're just asking for lower UTI. Okay, good. Which action is appropriate for the RN to delegate? Jay? Oh, um, I said three. Provide client with a glass of milk for the snack. Okay, anybody else? Elena? I put four. Strain and record urine. Okay, anybody else? I put four. Um, let's think about this one. We don't know what kind of stone we got. It just calls it a urethral stone. So why would this not be? Because of the calcium. Calcium. Yeah. calcium. So that could be if that's a calcium stone. So <laughs> we want to find out what that stone is. We'd strain and record your now. So we'd strain the urine and send it for test. Now, if I've already got what kind of stone it is, that would change that question completely. Mm -hmm. I'd have to find a, a right answer to put in there. Because <laughs> we definitely don't want to restrict fluid. We want to increase them. And we don't keep them in bed. We want to move it around so that stone will pass. So I'd have to find that better. All righty, Samantha. What is the resp or appropriate response? Now we've got a calcium stone, and I want to know why I need to talk to a dietitian. I put three. Put what? I put three. She put three. All right, anybody get anything else? You all like three. Awesome, that's correct. <laughs> Diet instructions based on the analysis of your kidney stones may help prevent future stones. So we could do, we know we had some things we could do for calcium, right? Alrighty. A client with renal calculus has been receiving normal saline and now our heart rate's up. Alyssa. Three. 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 I'm sorry, my ear is doing the underwater mm -hmm. thing today, so I'm having trouble hearing y'all. Uh, three. Anybody else have another one? Good, because three is correct. Anytime you have no urine output for four hours, that's a problem, right? Uh, nausea, you're expecting that. Flank pain, that's where you're gonna fit. You could feel that. Client reports sweaty, feeling sweaty. With you got a stone, you're gonna have that. But it's this fact that we've been putting 125 cc's of uh, saline in for eight hours, and now we've had a four-hour gap that we didn't get anything out. What could that mean? Retention. What? Retention. But the, 
retention is caused by what? Not necessarily retention, but stones, what, Josh? The stone's blocking the um, obstruction. Hydro-ureter is blocking the ureter or up in the end. What can that lead to? Hydronephrosis. Hydronephrosis, and what can that lead to? Kidney damage. Yeah. Kidney damage. Good. Which statement is of most concern uh, by the daughter of the 88-year-old? Sheena. Oh, I put three. My mother has not been herself lately. She is never confused because we know that the elderly sometimes don't have anything but confusion. Mm -hmm. Good. Which clinical finding indicates the development of a potential complication? Nicole? Three. Three? Okay. Anybody put something else? Two. Two. Okay. Anybody put one? Got a couple of ones. And how about four? All right, so we're good getting rid of four. Uh, so we're looking for complications that would concern us because our patient has urinary incontinence. So three incontinent episodes in 24 hours. Why did y'all pick that one? Who picked it? What was your rationale? What was the thought behind it? My first thought was um, like it could mess up like skin, the uh, skin integrity. Okay, you're on the right track. Would you expect to see three episodes if somebody's incontinent in the nursing home? Yeah. Yeah. So, but your thought process is good because incontinence and in skin, we do worry about that. All right. Uh, how about number three? Foul strong odor. I would think that would indicate a UTI since it's the foul smell, and that's why I chose it. Okay. But have y'all walked around in our uh, long-term care facility? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, true. <laughs> you get this odor even if it's just a lot of pee around, mm -hmm. okay? How about number two? What's the rationale behind that one, Michelle? Uh, you're going to have skin breakdown. Uh, you're, you're heading that way. Okay, yeah, this is your like skin that. integrity that you were thinking. You were on the right track, but if you've got this circular area on the thigh and that does not blanch, that's a beginning uh, ulcer, and you've got incontinence, so that's going to be a problem for this. Okay? All right, good. Which intervention is appropriate to implement for an ambulatory client receiving bladder training? Natalia. Natalia? Natalia. There's like an imaginary eye in there somewhere. There's an imaginary eye <laughs> in there. Um, I put A or 1. Offer bedpan or urinal at regular intervals. Okay. Anybody else? I put 2. Put 2. Instruct client about the importance of a regular routine for elimination. Alright. Any 3's or 4's? Alright. So let's look at your rationale. Uh, so first off, who do we use bladder training with? A week, not a week. Yeah. Oh. Patients that are with it. Patients that are with it, that understand. And uh, I also put on here that this patient was ambulatory. Oh. ambulatory. So I might be upset if you offer me a bed <laughs> I can get up pee, thank you very much. <laughs> All right. Regular intervals, that part of the statement is good, but they need to get up and go, okay? So instruct client about the importance of a regular routine for elimination. So with our bladder training, these are those patients that have urge and we make them wait and we try to get them to a regular interval of three hours before they go. And then remember the habit training is the ones that have incontinence. And that's really a regular interval because those are the ones we either put on an even or an odd schedule and we take them. No matter if they're just peeking in their bed, we take them to the bathroom on that regular interval. Okay? Okay. Uh, priority nursing action for a client with an indwelling catheter. They've got a temp of 102.2, hot flush skin, dark cloudy urine in the collection bag. Haley. I said four. Of 
obtain a urine specimen for culture and sensitivity as ordered. Anybody get anything different? All right, we don't irrigate the catheter. Uh, we wouldn't, we are gonna document it and we're gonna keep monitoring, but is this an expected outcome with a Foley? No, no, no. So we gotta do something. Uh, limit PO fluid, what's wrong with that? All right, and this is our lady that's leaving with the UTI, and how do we know she understands? Uh, <coughs> name? Uh -huh. I said three. I will be sure to avoid both before and after intercourse. Any others? All right, that's the right one. We don't take frequent fasts. That gives us a little environment. Uh, this is what we don't want to wear. We want cotton. And cranberry juice is good. It decreases that acidity of the urine. I got a question about that one. Okay. I, I saw something that said, okay, wait, cranberry juice, and if it's interstitial cystitis, it can be an irritant. What's that? Yes, it can, absolutely. What, what is interstitial? Interstitial is more in the lining of the bladder. And uh, it's a little more, it, it's more of a, it irritates and this is kind of an acidic juice, so that would irritate and cause pain. I also read where it said if it's like high fructose cranberry juice, the sugar for the bacteria. Say again, let me get over here so I can hear you. Oh, the high fructose um, cranberry juice for that sugar in the bacteria. Yeah. Yeah, that's true, that's true. So pure cranberry juice that we hadn't made better is what you want to use and it's to get that acid in the urine that bacteria don't like. But you're right with interstitial, it can be an irritant. Any of those acidic drinks can be an irritant. Okay, good job. So how'd you do? Pretty good, pretty good. good. <laughs> I'll give you a little idea where we are and where you are, I should say. So we're going to finish up this chapter. Uh, here we go. And we were here at Urothelial Cancer. And talking about the fact that uh, smoking is probably the, one of the highest risk factors for it. It is one of the more common. It's the lining of the bladder uh, that has the tumor. And 75% of these patients present with painless hematuria. Now we've seen a lot of the same things. That blood in the urine usually gets us to the doctor's office because there are so many bad things that can be. A UTI, though, could just cause some blood to appear in the urine. <laughs> so uh, it's not always a problem, but it certainly is something that needs to be checked out because that could be uh, a cancer. Other causes of, of uh, bladder cancer are exposure to chemicals. And hairdressers are one of the groups that have a higher risk of bladder cancer because of the all the chemicals they use on the hair. So they need to glove, they need to wear the appropriate uh, items for fiddling with that and wash their hands real good uh, because that can increase their chance of bladder cancer. Now all cancers are going to be staged, okay? If we look at bladder with, for an example of how that works, a stage one cancer is just right there in the epithelial of whatever organ it's in. In other words, it's just uh, on the outside, the tumor's there, but it hadn't gone anywhere. You caught it pretty early, okay? Stage two, we now move to the muscle layer of the bladder. That detrusor muscle, remember, is in the bladder. That would be stage two. Stage three, we start to metastasize. Now we're seeing some in other reproductive organs. And stage four is when that cancer has left its original area 
And now we see it in the lungs, the bone, other places, other organs outside the original area. Okay? And that happens to these lymph nodes. When cancers get into the lymph nodes, they can go anywhere in the body because the lymph nodes drain our fluids and things. So uh, those are the general stages that we stage cancer with. And it's important to know that where we are because you treat them differently. So you're on it, gonna wanna get a cystoscope, which is gonna go up in there, and we're gonna take a biopsy on the tumor and find out where the stage is. We're gonna biopsy a close-handed lymph node and uh, see if you find any cells in there and do uh, MRI, CTs, work them up to see where they are um, with the cancer. A lot, of, a lot of times you can do a PET scan. That's another thing that does a full body scan and looks at if it's metastasized that far, okay? So we have non-surgical things that we can do and we have surgical things. Now my, I think apparently your slides look a little bit different but same kind of information. I don't know how that happened because I could work so hard, but I could not, I, I can't, for some reason I think I've got my slide that looks like yours somewhere else on a different PowerPoint. But. Um, so chemo and radiation are used if they're further along, stage two, stage three, to mainly to shrink the tumor down. We usually end up, especially if there's metastasis, going in there and taking it out, okay? The smaller, S, I mean, stage one tumors, if it's just a stage one in the lining, then we can use bladder washes. And there's two things that we use for bladder washes. Uh, adriamycin is a chemotherapeutic agent, and BCG, which is an immunotherapy agent, but it is a bacterium related to tuberculosis. So one thing you need to tell the patients is they will always test positive for TB. If they get a TB skin test after having these bladder washes with BCG, <coughs> it will be positive. Uh, so what we do with these is instill the uh, agent into the bladder through a Foley. It's left in there for a prescribed number of hours, usually two hours. And you have the patient turn this way, turn this way, maybe turn on their stomach, but you're trying to coat the entire bladder, okay? And then <clears throat> you drain the um, fluid, the insulation out, and they can go home. We do it once a week for about three or four weeks. When they go home, they should drink a lot of fluids flush anything left in the bladder out. They should not share a toilet with anyone else for 24 hours. And after they're finished, they should clean that toilet with Clorox. Okay? And that is best with those superficial cancers, stage ones. Now, as I said, the chemo and the radiation are not gonna kill the cancer, but it's gonna reduce the size of the tumor and it helps to prolong life for these patients. Anytime you're given a, a patient chemo, remember we're looking for adverse reactions, bad outcomes, their white counts drop, their neutropenic. When it gets below 2,000, what do we do? Reverse isolation. Uh, so they're very prone to infection. They're they're at a high risk of infection at that point. And don't think it's only done for the patients on the chemo floor. We had a patient last year that came in and uh, I can't remember what they came in for. Something totally related to their cancer diagnosis, unrelated I mean. And uh, they'd only been there a few hours by the time they came in in the middle of the night. So they hadn't had that full nursing assessment yet. And the student went in and you know did a head to toe, came back and looked at her labs, and she's like, I got a really low white count. It's like 1,800. I said, ooh. <laughs> well, she had gone and looked.
looked in the history and she said he, she or he, I can't remember, was supposed to have chemo last week, but couldn't because of this white count. And they are on chemotherapy, but I didn't get that in the court. And I said, okay then, what do we need to do? We started them on reverse isolation. So don't assume it's just the patient on a cancer floor. You know, check everything. <laughs> That was very important for that patient to be, to be on reverse isolation. And they had got it when they did their full assessment when the nurse had done it, but it was, you know, change of shift and all that thing, all that stuff going on. All right, so surgically managing it, we usually end up having to take the bladder out. And remember, the bladder is where we store our urine. So we gotta have somewhere else to store it, right? Uh, I don't think your slide has his nail bladder on it. Mr. Glass that was here this morning said he has taken care of a patient that had that. And what they do is connect the ureters um, into the, uh, the intestine. They use the small intestine, make a little pouch, and it's connected. It says a urethra, but they're connecting it the, the, with the bowel, into the bowel. And so when they pee, it comes out where their stool would normally come out. So uh, you have to take, they have a lot of problems with incontinence and they have trouble with infection. Uh, the cystectomy, uh, when we totally take out the bladder, there are two different things that you normally see done. An ileal conduit or a cold pouch. An ileal conduit takes a piece of the ileum, both of them do actually, but with the conduit, we're attaching the ureters here to our little piece of conduit, and then we're making a stoma on one end. We've reanastomosed where we took it. We've made a stoma here, and the urine comes out here. Now, if you've taken care of patients with stomas, anybody? It flows constantly and they have to wear an appliance, okay? The other thing that you may see done is called a Coke pouch. And now we've got a piece of ileum that we make into a little pouch with an end, kind of a tail on it, so it looks more like a bladder. The ureter is attached down at the bottom, so this thing fills up, and then we've got a stoma here to the outside, and it's called a continent stoma because it doesn't run continuously. Just looking at it from gravity, see it's up a little higher. And the patients, because this, the nerve endings in here are not good, the patient doesn't get that feeling of, oh, I'm full, like I gotta go pee. They just have to learn and balance their fluid intake with how often they need to uh, catheterize that stone. So they will need to learn to catheterize and usually about every three to four hours, just like we go to the bathroom, about every three to four hours. Uh, and they'll use those disposable one-time little intermittent caps that, that we use with patients that are capping at home. So these patients with the Coke pouch learn to cap these patients with the ileal conduit have to learn to use an appliance, how to apply it, and how to take care of that stone. Okay? So, what kind of problems post-op from this surgery, we've taken a piece of this ileum, we've re we've made a little conduit, put the ureters there, made a stoma, have a nice little appliance on it. As the nurse, what are you going to be watching for? What kind of complications can occur from this? Do you want to make sure it's still viable? The stoma being viable. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes, you have to continually monitor this. It needs to be what? Pink and rosebuds. Okay. You might have a little bleeding around it, but there shouldn't be any frank bleeding. I had one when I was. Uh, working with an interstomal therapist, guy came in, it was black. Okay. We were like, oh, that's not good. <laughs> they ended up having to, to build him another one. But he just, you know, he was still peeing, so he didn't know. 
Uh, okay, what else? Skin breakdown. Skin breakdown, so they really need education on how to take care of that stoma and apply that appliance. When you first have any kind of stoma put in, it's going to be bigger and it starts to shrink down. GU stomas generally are smaller than a GI stoma because the intestines are bigger. Uh, and it will eventually get to the size. So usually while they're in the hospital, we're still cutting. We're still measuring and cutting. We don't want it to be rubbing up against the stoma, but we want it to almost touch it to protect that skin. And uh, we used to use stoma adhesive paste around it and then put the appliance on it. The patient should eventually, when the first day you put it on, it's going to lean to where, because the patient may be in bed more than they are standing up. But after the patient starts walking and getting mobile, it needs to be up so they can dump it in the toilet or into a measuring tank. Uh, okay, what else? There's another biggie here, that with this type of surgery, we've messed with something. It's Bio not a renal thing. Bio huh? Oh, yeah. Okay. I was going to say bowel adhesions. Bowel uh, adhesions, yes, later, but what else? We made a nice little anastomosis here, sewed them together. What if it leaks? What are we going to get? Peritonitis. Peritonitis. And what are the symptoms? Rigid board-like abdomen. Rigid board-like abdomen. Fever. So we need to, that's complication from this surgery. Doesn't have anything to do with pee, does it? But it is definitely something that you need to be watching for. Okay? And then here's our nice pretty pill coach. Alright, so fluid balance, post-op, because we need to know, when I say strict, they'll probably come back with a catheter or foley. Uh, and we need to be watching. Well, they'll have that stoma, so we'll be able to measure that. Or either they may put a, a temporary Foley in the coat pouch, or either just have you cap it every so often to see what's coming out. So we're still keeping track of I know for these patients. NG tube, why do I need an NG tube with a GU surgery, Quan? Put some of that pressure off of the uh, yeah, get that pressure out of the abdomen so it's not pushing down there on my surgery site. Wound care, not only the stoma, or not only the incision, but the stoma. Mobilization, we want them up and moving. Get everything going. Uh, and they're going to have to learn how to take care of everything. Uh, education, so with the coat pouch, they're learning how to cap it intermittently. And with the stoma, they're learning how to use an appliance. And both of them need to look at the skin care, uh, how you know how their urine output is, how they manage their fluid intake related to the urine output. Okay. And there's a nice, pretty. I think this is probably a uh, an ostomy, a GI ostomy. Uh, they're bigger, but that was another thing when I was with that service that we did was meet with these patients early on because you want that stoma not to be in my little fat tube here, I want it, or in this little den in. I want it on a nice flat surface that I'm going to get good adhesion that protects the skin better. And when you're laying down on a surgery table, it kind of gives you false impressions of where good things are. <laughs> so we always marked it ahead of time, get that in a good place, and then you continue to watch the color of the nurse, is there bleeding, is there swelling, is there stool coming out of it? Is there urine coming out? Okay. With the urine, they may come back with a Penrose drain for a little while. <coughs> and we just keep watching. All right, bladder trauma uh, is usually some type of blunt trauma, stabbing, gunshot wound. Uh, any fractures that happen, we stabilize everything else before we get into the bladder. Cause we, and I don't think y'all have this for some reason. Uh, but if you have damage that bladder, we've got to go in there and fix things if it's torn or, uh, or anything. So pain below the level of the umbilicus, sometimes it radiates to the shoulder, 
you're an ER doc, they can tell you something may be wrong with the bladder or an ER nurse. Didn't say a whole lot about that one, but. All right, did y'all find out what these were? Nobody looked this up? I have the most uncurious. <laughs> this morning's group didn't look this up either. Seriously? They are kidneys. What kind of kidneys? Polycystic. Polycystic, yeah. They got cysts all over them. This little girl, I think she was 24. Polycystic kidney disease is genetic. And those kidneys just keep having the cysts on them. They're inside and outside. They get bigger and bigger, and they eventually will end up on dialysis. They need a kidney transplant. So uh, if I've got this, Sitting in my retro peritoneal in here, what kind of symptoms am I going to have if my kidneys look like that? Pain. <laughs> Severe pain. Pain. That is a biggie. Especially when the cysts are, they can rupture. What did you say, Christine? Pain and bloating. Bloating, okay. Did you say something else? Breathing could be a problem, yes, sir, because that diaphragm drops down if they're big enough. It could be very good. Nobody's mentioned that. Uh, who else? Who's that hat back there? Sharon. Huh. What else? What are the kidneys going to think? Mm, I was bleeding. Bleeding? I guess if cysts ruptured, you can see blood through your urine, pus, definitely. Those do get infected. What else is in here that is going to be crowding? What else in my abdomen? What's the biggest organ in my abdomen? Intestines. Huh? Intestines. Intestines. So if that's next door pushing on me, what's it going to do with my function of my intestines? So, obstruction, so what do they commonly have to deal with? Constipation. Constipation. Hypertension? Yeah. These kidneys don't work very well. Okay, they're not getting perfused. And they uh, initial, they eventually end up having to uh, have a transplant. So, <coughs> just remember that picture when somebody says, what are polycystic kidney diseases cause? What kind of assessment would you see? Think about the path I want. And we're going to cover this a little bit more, a little bit. Okay. Let's pull up day two. Any questions? This is the wrong one. Pyelonephritis, 
glomerulonephritis, nephrotic syndrome, the polycystic disease, hydrouretor diabetic nephropathy, some big things. And all of these are going to have very similar, sometimes similar assessments, but we're going to look at what differentiates these, okay? So we've mentioned polynephritis before. It is more common in young people. It is an infection in the kidneys. And in pregnancy, you sometimes see it in second or third trimester. It can cause premature labor. Okay, so we need to identify and treat it as quickly as possible. Uh, chronic polynephritis, every time you have a bout with polynephritis, it causes a little scarring and a little damage to your kidneys. So chronic can end up really causing some severe damage. So we want to uh, fix whatever's happening as soon as possible. Some things that can lead to this uh, are recurrent lower uh, tract infections, UTI. Although our body, those ureters are so long, it's usually hard for that bacteria to get up there. But if we've got strictures, a stone, diabetes, uh, overuse of NSAIDs. NSAIDs cause decreased perfusion to the kidney. And while they are wonderful medications, especially if you've got migraines or arthritis, you really have to watch that. We all know about stomach problems. And, uh, but, they can they decrease perfusion to the kidneys, and if you're on them chronically, that's a problem. The other thing they do is can decrease platelet count. So, polynephritis can be either acute or chronic, and the chronic is going to end up causing you more kidney damage and can lead to renal failure. It will cause hypertension. The kidneys won't be able to. Uh, to concentrate as well, and they can end up with renal failure, which you, uh, with pyuria, you'll see pus if there's, uh, with the infection, but the azotemia, the proteinuria, because we're not filtering waste products, they're staying in the body, and that's not a good thing. So, and I tell the morning class, don't, when it says assessment recognized cues, that is just me preparing for our class that's coming through. I think we get them in the fall. That will be the first people to take the next gen in class. And of course, everything changes. <laughs> and they have still the nursing process, but now they're calling assessment recognizing cues. So there'll be a few words. I started changing some words around just to, so don't let that bother you. Please. So, we want to know about their history of UTIs. Do they have anything that would cause them to have recurrent polynephritis? Are they stone producers that increases their chances of infection? Um, are they, um, do they have strictures? Do they have anything going on that can increase that? We want to look at their lab cult their cultures and things. And these are the same that we looked at with a urinalysis. However, I think C-reactive protein and erythrocytimentation rate was not in there. Those are two blood tests that will increase when you have uh, an infection uh, or inflammation. The immune system's response includes an increase in those things to that inflammation and how they're working to get rid of it. Uh, the CT or the kidney ureter bladder, those are x-rays, but CT is usually used because we want to look and see where the problem is. Is there a stricture? Are there stones? Is there a problem causing uh, this to recur so much? And of course, we talked about the fact that these patients are a lot sicker. They have that flank pain uh, because of the infection and the inflammation process that's going on. This is, uh, they'll have tissue destruction. So we want to get this cleared up as quickly as possible because the longer it happens and the more often that it recurs, they'll have kidney damage. And 
chronic causes hypertension, which hypertension can decrease this kidney function some itself, but this just makes it worse. Um, pyelonephritis in children can lead to hypertension later in their lives. <clears throat> so we want to jump on that as quick as possible too. If your if the child has recurrent UTIs <laughs> or kid, actual pyelonephritis, then we need to get that treated and find out what's causing it as quickly as possible. So what do we do to treat these patients? Antibiotics, <coughs> high calorie, low protein, fluids as we can get it to them, warm compresses to so the flanks will help with the pain. We want to vital, uh, monitor those vital signs, trend them, look at their temps, their heart rates, uh, their eye nose. Are we having any damage? Watch their weight. That will show if they're gaining, holding on the fluids. Rest is very important until their temperature goes away. All right, surgically, when we talk about surgical management of pyelonephritis, it's an infection. You know, why would we operate? Well, if there's stones, if there's a stricture, we operate to get rid of whatever is causing the problem. Okay? All right, home management. Finish out all of the antibiotics. Remember, we always have to do that. Prevent dehydration. Keep yourself hydrated. If they've had kidney damage, they may need to go on a low protein, lower protein diets, sodium restricted diets, depending on any damage. Blood pressure control is very important because that can only exacerbate any damage that's there. Fluid therapy, we need to keep those kidneys hydrated. Keep them perfused, as long as we're not worried about heart and fluids. Catheter care, diet is gonna depend on uh, how much damage there's been, and then recurrence. If they have a lot of recurrence, then we need to find out why and fix that problem. All right, which assessment data would the nurse anticipate in a client with acute pyelonephritis? Frequency? Okay, think about symptoms. This is upper, but do we replicate some of the lower urinary tract symptoms? So, would we see urinary frequency? Yeah. How about dysuria? Yeah. Oliguria. Is that acute pyelonephritis? Have we damaged the kidneys yet? No. So we shouldn't see oliguria. Heart rate, elevated. Do we see that with infection? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uranium. Oh, that's right. This is again acute, so we shouldn't be having uremia yet. Custom vertebral angle tenderness. That tells us it's up in the kidney. Okay? All right, any questions? All right, well, we're going to look at glomerulonephritis now. And this occurs. Right here, in this glomerulus of the nephron, where we're bringing uh, fluids in and we're filtering. So this is your GFR. This is the filtration that's going on. This tells us how well our kidneys work. When this goes bad, our kidneys are not working properly. So, glomerulonephritis is one of those diseases that can lead to, it's the third most common for why patients get end-stage renal disease. Mostly it's chronic. It has two types. It has an acute and a chronic. The chronic is generally 
what leads to end-stage renal disease. But the acute can also. But they're totally different. The acute glomerulonephritis is an immune complex that develops. It's an antigen antibody complex that develops after a strep infection. And it starts attacking our glomerulus. And uh, the glomerulus can eventually die. And then it doesn't work. Okay? So it is uh, related more with the immune system. Now, as it says here, we can get primary and secondary, which has come because we've had an injury to the glomerulus uh, from outside somehow. Or secondary comes from lupus, diabetes. Those things can affect the glomerulus. But the acute glomerulonephritis occurs because the patient has generally had an infection and it's usually strep, and an antigen antibody uh, complex is attacking that glomerulus. Well, if something's attacking the glomerulus, then it is not going to be able to filter, and you're going to end up in fluid overload. And these patients will present as if they're in congestive heart failure or fluid overload. But it's all stemming from the glomerulus not being able to function. So we're not, we treat them for that infection. You start asking those questions and you find out they recently had a strep throat. Or they've got a wound on their leg where they had some type of infection in it. Children, you have to really watch. You know, children get strep throat, fair amount. You need to be uh, cognizant of their urinary activities after that because they can get this. And it can lead to damage and uh, acute kidney injury, chronic kidney injury. Okay. So they come in looking like this, like they've got fluid overload. They could have the crackles in their lungs. Periorbital edema and dependent edema are two of the most common things that they'll have. But then you start looking and they've got protein, hemuria, hematuria, oliguria, dysuria. It's a renal issue here, and you'll see. Um, they've got edema, and then they'll also have a low-grade fever, okay, which is different than just for them. However, they can hold on to enough fluid that we end up in congestive heart failure. They have an S3 gallop, okay? They have neck vein distension because we've got too much fluid on board. Let me go back one. So, we're going to treat them with diuretics. We're going to restrict their sodium, water, potassium, protein. This is for the hypertension and the edema. This is to prevent any problems with their uh, kidneys. They may actually end up on dialysis, or they may end up having to be put on plasmapheresis. Do y'all know what that is? Very similar to dialysis, but it takes your plasma, which is where that antigen antibody complex is being formed, and it cleans it out. And then it replaces, puts plasma, clean plasma back in. So it's similar to dialysis. So um, what we're doing is fighting that infection off as quick as we can and supporting the kidneys in the meantime. Okay, so recognizing some more cues, we're going to be watching a urinalysis. We're going to look at their creatinine, BUN and creatinine. We're going to look at their GFR. Be sure that our kidney function is not going down. They may need to have a biopsy. Just be sure that that uh, bacteria hasn't affected the kidney more than we, we think. They're going to be put on antibiotics, and we're going to treat symptoms, the fluid overload, and support perfusion to those kidneys. 
So the big things are going to be managing their infection, preventing complications, and providing appropriate patient education for when they go home. While we're monitoring them, that would be their temp to look for more infection. We got to monitor their blood pressure and keep that pressure down. Fluid overload, what do we assess for that? Eye nose, their daily weights, we look at their edema. We want to see it going from plus four down to plus two, down to plus one, gone. If we have a plus two and the next day it's a plus three, we're not doing something wrong. It's getting worse. Our outcome is for it to get better. Uh, ascites, pulmonary edema, congestive heart failure. These things can occur because we're not getting enough fluid off. So although the heart failure is not what caused this, the acute can lead to heart failure. And then we got a problem because when the heart fails, we don't use the kidneys very well. So the kidneys are going to be very upset with us. Restrict their fluids. We need to keep the kidneys perfused enough, but we need to get the overload off. High calorie, low protein, low sodium for the blood pressure and potassium because those electrolytes will start being held on to. Bed rest um, until we get the temp down and the infection under control. All right, questions about acute? Now we're going to talk about chronic. Chronic is different. There's no antigen antibody here. Chronic occurs over a long period of time. And you may hear people in the dialysis clinic say, I don't know how this happened. I was doing fine. Went in to see my doctor and all of a sudden he tells me my, something to do with my kidneys isn't working. And six months later I'm on dialysis. These are the patients that probably had chronic glomerulonephritis, diabetes can cause some of that, hypertension can cause it. But the glomerulus don't just like an acute, ah, it's an overnight thing. With chronic, it's been building for years. And remember, just like hypertension, we don't, I don't know what my blood pressure is standing here. You don't know what yours is sitting there. So people, and people don't, I go to the, I have a checkup every year. You know, I'm gonna watch that. But a lot of people don't. My brother-in-law's twin died two years ago from a massive MI. He's 62. He had never been to the doctor. Well, he'd been, but it'd been like 30 years. But that got him to the doctor. He smokes. <laughs> And um, of course, he had hypertension, and the, he's on blood pressure medicine now. But I was just shocked that he'd never been, he didn't have yearly checkups. Oh, uh, so you know, what we do with chronic glomerulonephritis is we hope we find it as early as we can, and then we treat the symptoms that are occurring. So we do that by checking BUN, creatinine, GFR. GFR is not something that you're regularly going to check, but if you've got a patient that you really think is having some problems, you would check and keep up with that. Uh, sodium and phosphate, because those things go up as our kidney fails. You're going to be assessing the fluid balance. Are they having periods of edema? Where their feet get swollen? They're having a hard time uh, with their blood pressure control? Those kind of things. So we look at history also. We do physical exams, we look for crackles, we look for edema, um, do they smoke, look at those labs, are they having any electrolyte issues? We wanna know, uh, you know, are they diabetic? Do they have comorbid diseases? Are they overweight? Do they need to be on antihypertensives? So kidneys, one thing about the kidneys is 
they fail in an organized manner. Here is our GFR that's normal, 90 to 130. There still may be a little bit of damage, but we're not going to see it. We've got a normal GFR. Everything's cooking along. The thing is, you may not, generally, when somebody starts noticing swelling, uncontrolled hypertension, they generally are way down here and have lost 75% of their nephron function. We don't see it quickly because we've got a lot of nephron. So as those organized kidneys tend to start to fail, we get below 90 to 60, kidney damage, mild kidney decrease in function. We still don't know it. Stage three, moderate function. We probably still don't know this. But hopefully, if we're seeing a doctor somewhere in here, we start to notice that he starts to notice there's some fluid issues, a little bit. Your BUN and creatinine, BUN's good, but your creatinine's creeping just a little. He'll check your GFR. You're having more trouble controlling that hypertension. So one thing about this is that once you lose nephrons, you can't get them back. So what we do here is called conservative management. Because as you see, we go through dietary fluid, drug therapy. Dialysis is, in transplant is the end game to chronic renal failure. End stage renal disease occurs down here where we're in 30 to 15. This is when we get close to 15. Depending on the uremic symptoms the patient is experiencing, they're starting to talk to them about dialysis. <laughs> so they get put on dialysis. There's our lady on dialysis, and we're going to talk about that next week. And uh, get put on the transplant list if they're eligible. So chronic glomerulonephritis is one of those big deals that, you know, it's usually combined with the diabetes or the hypertension, but it's, it's slow and occurs over years. And what the best, what we hope for is to get it in here so that we can make changes in dietary, low sodium diets, keep track of their potassium and phosphorus. And if they start creeping up, then we got to cut some of that out of their diet. Uh, fluid intake. If they're starting to retain fluid, we got to decrease their fluid intake. Uh, drug therapy, hypertension, managing that hypertension. Remember last week when I told you what's that system the kidneys have to protect them from low perfusion? Ross. Ross. Renin angiotensin, because it says, oh, I'm going to, you know, I don't have enough perfusion. So it constricts. It does that angiotensin 1 to 2. It's a potent vasoconstrictor. But <coughs> it gets out of, out of control especially when our kidneys aren't functioning very well, they've got too much, then they think their perfusion is not as good and that it's just a vicious cycle. We'll look at that in just a minute. And um, we need to keep those blood pressures stable. Okay? Uh, and then, of course, dialysis is where we're going to end up. But we can stay in this area for a long time if we've got a patient that will. And the other thing is we work on their comorbids. Get their diabetes under control. Get their hypertension under control. And uh, their exercise, their diet, all that stuff. Um, I tell you, with diabetes, one of, the, one of the really good things that happened was that lab work called uh, A1C. I used to, my dad was a general practitioner. I used to work in his office, and these people would come in, and their glucose would be 105, 100. Really? I just saw them at Dairy Queen yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> you know. And they were going and just getting their insulin bumped up a little bit. So they come into the doctor's office and, yeah, I'm doing great. <laughs> if they wanted a piece of cake, they'd eat their cake and then they'd shoot up a little bit. <laughs> now, <laughs> that ain't sound good. <laughs> oh, gosh. So now we've got an A1C that looks at uh, like one to three months of how have you really been doing? 
and you get somebody with a glucose of 95 on that day, and then the A1C comes back and it's not. Hello. <laughs> I think we got a problem here. So controlling that diabetes is really important. All right, any questions? Hyalonephritis, acute and chronic glomerulonephritis. All right, we got a new one. Nephrotic syndrome. Y'all need to pee yet? Y'all want to take a break? I know you just got to yes, yes. Now, now, now she says I can go take a break. All right, let's take a quick break. I see more than one person leaving. I'm like, uh oh, here.